In this video, we're going to look at another example of using the definition of the derivative to find the slope of a curve of a given function at given x values. We've already established before that the process for finding the slope of a curve at given x values for a function is the same process and concept as finding the equation, or not the equation of the tangent line, but the slope of the tangent line, rather, for given x values of a given function. So what we're going to do to honor that process is we're going to first take a look at our f of x here and see if we have any discrepancies that arise that will throw off our process of evaluating this limit. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the domain of this given square root function. We know that square root functions have specific domains where they are defined and some places where they're not defined. And namely, the way that we can find that is we can take a look at the radicand of our equation, which is 7x minus 8, and we're going to use this to set up the inequality of the radicand greater than or equal to 0. Wherever the radicand returns a positive value, we can take the square root of that positive radicand. So we're going to look for the x value that makes this radicand here positive, or at least equal to 0 at the very least. So how we're going to do that is let's solve for x in this expression, or this inequality rather. So we get 7x is greater than or equal to 8, or when we divide by 7, we find that x has to be greater than or equal to 8 over 7. So our domain for this square root function is defined to be 8 over 7, or any x that's greater than or equal to 8 over 7, rather. We see that both the x values we're concerned with in this problem fit inside that parameter. 8 over 7 equals 8 over 7, and 17 over 7 is definitely greater than 8 over 7. So we don't have any things that we can rule out just yet. So what we're going to do now that we've established the domain and we know these x values are within that domain, we're going to start evaluating the derivative at these given x values. So the first we want to do is 17 over 7. So let's evaluate f prime of 17 over 7, which translate the definition of our limit to this. So we get f of 17 over 7 plus h minus f of 17 over 7 and this is all over h. So let's figure out what f of 17 over 7 is. Down here is a little scratch work. So f of 17 over 7 is going to look like 7 times 17 over 7 minus 8. I'm going to close the parentheses off there. And we see that multiplying 7 times 17 over 7, the 7 here and the 7 in the denominator are going to cancel out. So all we're left with is the square root of 17 minus 8, or the square root of 9, which gives us 3. So f of 17 over 7 is 3. So now in this next step, what we're going to do is we're going to substitute in 17 over 7 plus h in for x, and also substitute in 3 for f of 17 over 7. So we get this. So we have the square root of 7 times 17 over 7 plus h minus 8 for that, and then we're going to minus 3 over h. Now that we have this, we do a little quick mental pass to the limit check to ask ourselves, can we stop here? Like, does this give us our limit value? And the answer is no, because what we're going to get here is 7 times 17 over 7, which is going to reduce to 17 minus 8. Take the square root of that, which is technically going to be the square root of 9. So 3 minus 3, 0 over 0. This returns, again, in a determinate form. So what we're going to need to do first is do some manipulation of this function inside of our limit to see if we can find something more easy to work with in terms of finding our limit. So let's go ahead and distribute this 7 into this expression that we have here. So we get the limit as h approaches 0, still the square root, but now we're going to have 17 plus 7h minus 8 minus 3. That's what the radicand of this comes because we distribute 7 to 17 over 7. The 7s go away, so we're just left with 17. But then we get plus 7h and the minus 8 tags along. Then we get the minus 3 that we evaluated earlier. This is still over h. And now we see that inside of that square root, we can do a little bit of combining like terms with these constants. So what we're going to have now is 9 plus 7h minus 3 over h. So at this point, we see that we can really easily use multiplying by the conjugate to simplify this function down a little bit. So let's do just that. Let's multiply this in the numerator and the denominator by the square root of 9 plus 7h plus 3. Square root of 9 plus 7h plus 3. Okay, 
So after we do that multiplication, we're left with the limit as h approaches 0 of the expression inside the radical, the radicand, so we're left with 9 plus 7h, because we multiply the square root times itself, so the, radi the radical is going to go away, so we're left with this. And we know that the if we're looking at it in terms of a FOIL process, the next two multiplications will remultiply the outer terms, 3 and root 9 plus 7h, and negative 3 times root 9 plus 7h. We're going to get the same thing with opposite signs, so if we subtract them, they go away. So the only thing we have to worry about after that is the multiplication of our two last terms, which is negative 3 plus 3 or minus 9. And then, in typical multiplying by the conjugate form, we're going to leave our denominator in terms of its factors. So we're not going to take care of the distribution here yet, and there's a reason for that. It always happens. So what we can do to simplify this down a little bit more is we have this expression 9 plus 7h. We can drop the parentheses because there's nothing really affecting it. So we have 9 plus 7h minus 9. 9 minus 9 gives us 0, so all we have left in the numerator is 7h. So now we have the same thing in the denominator that we had from the previous step. But here what we have is we have 7 times h over h times some number here, some expression that evaluates to a number. When we have h in the denominator and h in the numerator like this, we can divide them away. So what we're left with is the limit as h approaches 0, 7 over square root 9 plus 7h plus 3. At this point, I don't really see any more manipulations that we can do right now. So let's do another pass the limit test, namely plugging in 0 for h, and see if we get our limit. So here, what this evaluates to is 7 over square root 9 plus 7h plus 3. But we said that we're plugging in 0 for h, right? So what this becomes is 7 times 0, or this goes away to be just 0. So here what we're going to have is 7 over the square root of just 9 plus 3, so which this evaluates to 7 over 3 plus 3, or 7 over 6. So by using the definition of the derivative, we have found that the slope of our curve at x equals 17 over 7 will give us 7 sixths. So we've evaluated the, the derivative at one point that we have here, now we need to worry about def uh, evaluating the derivative for x equals 8 over 7. So let's see what happens when we evaluate our derivative at x equals 8 over 7. Okay, so what this is going to translate to is the limit as h approaches 0 of f of 8 over 7 plus h minus f of 8 over 7 over h. So just like we found out what f of 17 over 7 was right here, let's figure out what f of 8 over 7 returns to us. So we're going to do that over here, kind of fence off this work that we already did. So f of 8 over 7 is going to look like the square root of 7 times 8 over 7 minus 8. So once we multiply 7 times 8 over 7, we know that these 7s cancel each other out. So we get the square root of 8 minus 8 or the square root of 0, which is 0. So we know that f of 8 over 7 returns a value of 0. So now let's evaluate f of x at x equals 8 over 7 plus h. So what we're going to have is, just to give myself a bit more room, we get the limit as h approaches 0 of the square root of 7 times 8 over 7 plus h. And this is going to need to be extended. And then we have minus 8. And then we know that f of 8 over 7 evaluated to 0, so we write that. And then we have over h. So here, now that we have this, we again do a quick mental pass to the limit test. And we know that this is going to evaluate to the square root of 8 minus 8, or 0 minus 0 over 0. So again, this returns an indeterminate form. So we don't really, we can't rely on this form of our limit to evaluate what we have. So let's go ahead and start doing some manipulation about the function. Here, what we're going to do is we're going to distribute the 7 into the parentheses and see what happens there. So here we get the limit, as h approaches 0, of the square root 
of 7 times 8 over 7 gives us just 8. And it's plus 7h minus 8. Again, we can leave off the minus 0 there. We don't have to worry about carrying that around. And it's still going to be over h. And we see that inside of our square root, 8 minus 8 evaluates to 0. So really all we have left is the limit as h approaches 0 of the square root of 7h over h. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to recall a property of radicals that we can use in order to break up a product inside of one radical into two different roots. So what I have is the limit as h approaches 0 of the square root of 7 times the square root of h over h. Now the reason why I did that is because in this form I can't really cancel anything out in terms of the h's because this h is part of this radical here. I can't evaluate it or cancel it out term by term. Here, now that I have the multiplication of two things in the numerator, I can get rid of this root h and a half power of this h to where all I'm left with is the limit as h approaches 0 of root 7 over root h. But now I want to think about what happens when I plug in or when I try to evaluate the limit as h approaches 0 of something over root h. Does this even exist? Does this limit as a whole exist? And the answer is no. Because if we look at the one-sided limits of this limit here, say we look at the limit as h approaches 0 from the right of root 7 over root h, we know that as we approach 0 from the right, we're going to take square roots of increasingly and arbitrarily small numbers, making this fraction arbitrarily large. So that makes this limit evaluate to positive infinity. But if we look at the limit as h approaches 0 from the left, that entails taking roots of negative numbers. So what that means is the limit from the left means taking square roots of arbitrarily small negative numbers, which in the real numbers, which is what we're dealing with here, we can't have that. So the limit from the left doesn't exist. These two limits here don't match. So whenever the one side limits don't match, we know that the limit in and of itself does not exist. So the limit here, as h approaches 0 of what we evaluated, doesn't exist. But what does that mean for us in context of our problem? That means that the derivative at the point in question that we're evaluating, which is x equals 8 over 7, so at x equals 8 over 7, the slope, because that's what we were trying to find this entire time, the slope of the curve is not defined. So if we ever run into a case where our limit doesn't exist after we've done manipulation to it and tried to evaluate it even more, if we get that our limit legitimately does not exist at the x value that we are evaluating at, what that means is the slope of our curve at that point is not defined.